Welcome back to the Professor Pan Podcast. David Pan here with episode number 146, Solzhenitsyn. That's episode number 146, Solzhenitsyn. Tanner, good morning. Good morning, David. Does that name ring a bell, Solzhenitsyn? No. Great. I'm glad I'm doing this episode. I'm not going to be down on you. I was actually talking to someone quite prominent nationally whose name I will not mention, and I said Solzhenitsyn, and they looked at me like, what? And missing a piece like this is like missing a building block. Got to get these building blocks in place so we know how we got here. So we're going to spend some time talking about um, Solzhenitsyn tonight, and we're going to talk about free speech, which is related. Um, boy, I'll tell you, I'm working very, very hard. Uh, I never thought in my uh, lifetime that I could or would be this engaged uh, across every second minute of my life. Yesterday, I burned out. I mean, I just, I get tired, you know, which is new for me. But I've, I've never worked at this level of um, uh, complexity. Uh, Royce and I drove to two events on Saturday. Uh, one in uh, North Branch, very successful, about a thousand people there. Then we drove up north to Pequot Lakes, did a beautiful event up there with a bunch of uh, very enthusiastic supporters. And we got home late. That was six hours of driving on Saturday. Sunday, I had guests in town from the movement. That would be uh, Miss Maureen Bannon was back. We spent some time together, which was great. And why is it great to spend time with Maureen? Because that war room is the nerve center of the entire movement, in my opinion. Uh, and, and that's why we're going to talk about Solzhenitsyn a little bit tonight, because we live in a world of ideas. Now, I have people that tell me, ah, you're a philosopher. You're not really doing the real thing. Well, you know, uh, my life's philosophy in action, number one. And number two, the people that say that to me are missing a lot because they don't really study. Uh, why they think the way they think, where do, their, where do their ideas come from, where are they headed? They're just a victim of circumstance, so to speak. They're not strongly connected to creating a future that enhances the well-being of the American citizens. And uh, when it comes to this uh, well-being issue, boy, right in, right in our own camp, we have uh, disagreements about how to talk about well-being. And uh, well-being, you know, well-being is a, a really, uh, it's a really simple idea, actually. Do you feel well? Good morning. Again, do you feel well today? Yeah, I feel well. Good. Then you're well. That's all there. It's just that simple. You know, I, I've said this, you know, it's like when I, I was first exposed to the yin-yang philosophy, and I'm coming out of this kind of Western frame where you know, philosophy is so complicated. You got to just bend your name, your mind into a pretzel to get the ideas. And I'm sitting there going yin and yang, cold and hot. There's got to be something more to it than that. And you know what I found out? There's not. It's cold and hot. Okay, it's very simple. It's simple, like well-being. You feel well or you don't. Now, I have to say for myself, um, I have not been feeling well for many months because I'm working at such an intense level and uh, I'm spending the well-being savings that I've built up over a lifetime. You can think of your well-being like a, like a savings account. If you have a high level of well-being, you have a lot of well-being savings. Some people are born, uh, they, it's in, the, in the Asian philosophy, it's called pre-birth chi. They come into the world with a really good machine. They're healthy. They're healthy by birth. Some of us have to develop our health. Okay, so what? So there's a plus and minus on both sides. If you come in super healthy, you can miss a lot. If you come in unhealthy, you can miss a lot. You miss different things. Each path has its pluses and its minuses, and that's really a lot about what health is about, is understanding every choice, every moment. It has a plus and a minus. So I'm spending some of my health right now 
in what? In trying to devote myself to the well-being of my fellow American citizens. I'm going at a really intense pace. So I want to tell you, thank you for joining. Thank you for sending out the links. You know, we're building a community. I, we, uh, we did a thing, Marina and I did a thing, and it wasn't all my engagement, but we had 77,000 viewers for that podcast. I bet you didn't know that. No. Almost 80,000. That's good. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, you know, we want everyone to please post the links in your social medias because here on YouTube, we're not going to get a lot of support. We're going to have to build it organically, and we're doing it. We're doing it, and we think we're doing something worthwhile, which is building a political action community, talking about the past, the history, the philosophy, how we got here, where we're going to go. And uh, where we're going to go, where I'm going to go, because I, I do feel my health is being eroded, is I'm going to fall back on what I know. What do I know? How can I reestablish a discipline of well-being at this really high level of performance that I'm asking of my mind, body, and spirit? Uh, one of my friends that I uh, know very well, who's, he's a phenomenal warrior. How phenomenal is he? He went hunting by himself. You know, generally speaking, have you ever gone hunting by yourself? By yourself. Like what do you, like by yourself? Like totally. go hunt? Yeah, nobody's there but you. Well, I mean, when I'm out in the woods, I'm by myself. No, I but, mean, okay, going yes. to the woods. Gotcha, gotcha. You're, you're a solo no, agent. I've, I've never done that. I've okay, always Okay, this dude hunted. went out to the prairie by himself with two hunting dogs, and he didn't want any, uh, you know, companions. He uh, rejected the company of his friends and family and went into the bush on his own. That guy is a warrior. And uh, it's interesting. The whole world is wired up now. So even where he was out in the prairie, out in the middle of nowhere, he had a Wi-Fi connection. And he was communicating with me. And I, I, uh, I mean, what he sent me was really quite profound. And one of the greatest profundities of it was, as he was communicating with me, the wind was blowing on the prairie. And I didn't answer him for about a half a day because when we communicate, we try to communicate with some meaning. And I said to him, the wind added a lot to what you shared with me. That's it, one line. And he came back, one line. Yes, it did. You know, that's the kind of stuff I think is cool. He was out in the prairie with the wind. You know, uh, the Chinese are our alleged enemies. Uh, and there's no doubt that there's cultural conflict. But in Chinese philosophy, in Chinese history, is a great reservoir of knowledge about how to enhance human well-being. They call it living in the natural way, kind of like uh, the Native Americans here in the United States. They live in the natural way. And as a matter of fact, because I spent 22 years training in this, trying to figure it out and become proficient in it, I found over the years that when I interact with Native Americans here in the United States, I always get along great with them because I know exactly where they're coming from because they live in nature, they live in the natural way, they observe the natural rhythms of life, they live in harmony with the world around them, which is really in essence, you know, what the Chinese philosophy, the traditional Chinese philosophy, not the current uh, Chinese culture, which is living under the yoke of communism, but the traditional uh, uh, philosophy of the Chinese people, which is about well-being and survival. And if you think about it, if you're pre-industrial, you know, when a mere scratch on your foot could lead to a blood infection with no antibiotics, you die. Obviously, being in harmony, paying attention, is much more important when there's no safety net. And the Chinese uh, focused on what was called qi, which we've heard that before. You've heard that, Tanner. Qi means energy. Means energy. Interesting in your Old Testament, if you're a New Testament person, if you read your Old Testament, like the Psalms, you'll see that the Psalms talk about chi also, 
They call it breath. Let every breath praise God. Every breath. And there's a connection between in the in the Chinese philosophy between qi and breath or breathing or air. There's energy in the air. We take in the energy and we expel the energy. And I was uh, out, it, you know, if you live in Minnesota, if you're a Minnesota activist, you know this time of the year, right now, right where we're at today. It's the end of summer, fall is here, we're heading towards winter. Right now, the weather is fantastic. You know, in the summertime, we have a lot of humidity, a lot of heat. That's broken now. The heat's broken. The humidity's broken. What do we have? We have very invigorating weather. It was about 50 degrees coming in today. The air is really clear. It's coming down from north. It's clean. The air is invigorating. I mean, it's you feel strong. And I've been under all this pressure actually for years because um, we had this COVID supply chain disruption, just talking about my, my business life. And, uh, you know, the supply chains became broken. We had massive inflation. Then the Fed, you know, pulled up on the stick and rapidly raised the interest rates. So for those of us that are quote unquote small business owners or entrepreneurs, maybe a better description, people that are self-governing as it, you know, uh, as it relates to their economic life, boy, this is tough. And, uh, I, you know, we're on the edge. We're on the edge as a country. We're on the edge as individuals. We know it. We, we're watching the news. But there's a tension, a tension that we're all living under, whether we acknowledge it or not. And I was out at an event with Royce on Saturday afternoon in North Branch, Minnesota. There was like a 1,000 people there. The weather was fantastic. And I took a breath. And I realized, even though I've been breathing for several years, I've had so much tension, I hadn't caught my breath in a really long time. And I breathed in and I said, wow, that felt good. That's well-being. So there's all these breathing exercises that are associated with well-being that I have worked with over the years, which I'm going to focus on again, not that it ever really goes away when you do it at the level that I was asked to do it, but it's, it's not wrong for me to go outside and just stand in my backyard and face the trees and face the skies, face the setting sun, see the colors in the sky. The, you know, the, the sky can be so beautiful as the sun's setting. You could have purples, you could have, um, yellows, blues. I mean, there's so much color to take in to just, you know, let go of my conscious mind and let these colors wash over me and then breathe out. When I breathe out, I collapse my lower abdomen just below my belly button. You know, I, 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 the, the action of breathing is not on the end. People try to breathe in, but that's not doing it. It's really the is the out. It's the out creating a void in your lungs. And then all you have to do is drop your stomach open and the air just comes in naturally. And it's a great feeling to have my feet planted firmly on the ground and be relaxed through my whole body, have really good posture. And I just stand there with really good posture. I feel like my head is suspended from heaven by a string. I stretch out my spine. I'm relaxed. And I just take, I could be out there for an hour. I could be out there for two minutes. I mean, right now, I maybe only have five minutes. But I'm going to go on record and say I'm going to go outside every night, even through the cold, and just breathe in that air and be part of that natural system. Because, you know, politics is somewhat unnatural. Being in this digital studio is somewhat unnatural. Right? Yeah. It is, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it makes you really start thinking what is natural and what isn't. Because I will argue there's one side, humans made this, and we're a natural being, so how isn't this natural? You know, like if honeys, or if honeys, if bees make honey, and honey's seen as natural, 
why is the technology we're surrounded by not natural? Because a natural being created it. That's a rather fourth industrial revolution point of view, young man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the kind of stuff we have to sort out. Is this natural? Is this the natural way? I'm going to say I agree with Tanner. It is the natural way. But when you become unbalanced, which is what Solzhenitsyn is going to talk about, when you become unbalanced and you lose the rut of what generated all this technology, when you become divorced from your center, so to speak, you become a setup for unwellness. That's why when I use my muscles to force the air out of my lungs by I put my I when I'm standing out there I put my focus my concentration about 2 or 3 inches below my belly button what the chinese philosophy calls the dantian dantian the tian the, the center the center of all things the center of all things in that philosophical tradition it's definitely the center of movement if you know how to move it's your big toes in your center that's how you make your body work so when i force that air out and i let it in and all I do is feel that air, taste that air, um, understand how that air interfaces with my lungs. Boy, I'm, I'm connected. So I share that personal experience. You know, we're an underground transmission. We know that, uh, you know, we have to talk to each other in a way that is uh, kind of cool. Kind of cool. We have to be kind of cool about what we do. Uh, I want to thank everybody for going to tireget.com. T-I-R-E-G-E-T dot com. Target is 2.0. It's reborn. If you've been there, go back. Because there's now billions of dollars of inventory up there. Billions. That's with a B. It's taken me a long time to put this together. In all of our major markets, in 87 major markets, we will install the tires for you at the lowest possible price in the United States of America. So I've got the value of having the very best tires because we live in a materialist Marxist world where everyone's trained on price, the price is right. I also add the service part. The service is right. And when you do it, you're supporting this broadcast and free people radio. And why do I say that? Because we need your support. You got to buy tires from someone. Please remember tireget.com. The next time you, a loved one, a friend, a family member, someone needs tires. You call in. I will personally help you get the tires you need. And thank you very much for listening. Well, that's a transition into the news that matters. And, uh, you know, I sit here every week looking at the news, and it just gets worse and worse. And, you know, uh, it can only go one of two directions. Either we're going to uh, continue to get worse and worse, or there's going to be what's called in French a rapprochement, and things will start to go in a better direction. Uh, I want to just say that um, we're only a week away from these exploding electronic devices in Lebanon, which wounded it, uh, thousands and killed uh, dozens of uh, Lebanese citizens and also members of the militant group Hezbollah. Uh, it was a suspected Israeli attack. It certainly was an Israeli attack. Such things do not happen by accident. Uh, but this um, this kind of a thing, so widely uh, reported, uh, so uh, filmed, uh, boy, uh, it's kind of a next level um, attack. Uh, it's very personal. When you start blowing people uh, up at the level of their groins, because that's where pagers are in your right front pocket, generally speaking, if you're a righty, if you're left-hander, it's your left front pocket. Those pages were in there. People were maimed. Uh, they were maimed in a way that's terrible. And I just want to play again. I played it when I was on with Maureen, but I think it's so striking. Could you please play number two? Boom, boom, boom. Uh, 
let me hear it say ayo ayo we have a name for this operation operation below the belt damn we have the biggest ball but, but are you left with any i mean you gotta laugh about it you know when you will get out of the hospital without fingers without a wee wee without the ability to see it's very hard to eliminate you one by one you were attacking us for 11 months with rockets and suicidal drones and we did not even shoot one bullet just a beep and in the best case you had just your fingers that flew off boom boom in the streets <laughs> While you're in shopping, maybe you should just stay at home. Not a good neighborhood to live in. We were thinking to ourselves, what does every Hezbollah terrorist care with them? It's two things. One American student close to their hearts and a beeper under their belt. But how could you know? Just a couple of months ago, you purchased those beepers from Iran. I mean, if you can't trust Iran. Actually, you had to think just a little bit. If someone got to Ismail Haniya on Iranian soil, those people can make your balls boil. I know it's embarrassing. Hezbollah boom 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 boom. All over Lebanon and in Syria. Someone put something in your beepers! This is so Yichi Ayash. The mega terrorist just wanted a new phone. But he did not know that we got to his phone first. Oh, he just planted something inside. He exploded on the first hello when his dad called. So anyway, everyone here in Israel are sending their hellos. And Hezbo Boom Boom try not to explode. Because this is what happens Beep. when a lion roars. Well, I'm going to say again, without getting into, you know, taking a side, in the actual conflict itself. Um, this kind of a victory lap, it just is demonstrative, demonstrative of the tribal hatreds that have grown up in this region that make this an intractable problem. Uh, I recognize that when people fight, there's a certain celebration when you win. We see that in sports. I mean, guy scores a touchdown and they do a dance in the end zone, right? Yeah. You know, I stopped watching football when they started dancing in the end zone. And that's not a cultural comment. That's a football comment. You know, I grew up a little bit earlier. You know, there's a great, I'm going to play this. Let's remember this for the next podcast or maybe next week. Jim Brown. Do you know the name Jim Brown? That's another name you don't know. Jim Brown was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, running backs in pro football history. The guy was unstoppable, unstoppable. And he played in an era when it was smash mouth football. And when he'd score, when he'd score, he'd just drop the football out of his hand and walk off the field. And that kind of cool, that kind of cool, like I won but I'm so cool, I'm not even going to let you know how I feel about it. That's what this country was at one time, and that's what the world was at one time. There was not a lot of self-aggrandizing when people had a deeper awareness of their mortality and their vulnerabilities. Uh, to see this woman um, take a victory lap after the uh, maiming of thousands of people. Uh, well, number one, she's stupid because they're going to be looking for her. That's number one. Number two, she feels she can't be gotten to or she wouldn't do that, which means not too bright. But number three, this is a, represent, a representative, really, the way this is out there, of the Jewish people. And uh, I'm going to tell you she doesn't represent how I feel about this. Um, I'm going to guess, Tanner, when you kill something in, when you're hunting, you don't take a victory lap for killing that living organism, do you? No. No. The, the most that I do is sit there and try to catch my breath because of hunter's high. When you <laughs> drop an animal, you are sitting there just shaking. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the most celebrating I do is I sit there. Maybe like a high five with my dad and crack a beer while we're gutting the deer, but no, we're not taking victory laps. Yeah, because it's a living organism. Yeah. I Right? And, yeah, and then to go further with that, like, just the, you know, my practice, like, I follow a lot with the Native Americans did, that I use every piece of that animal, animal. We're donating the hide. I think the only thing that's wasted are the bones themselves, which we give to dogs. But then, so, no, we're not taking victory laps because if we're taking another life. So then there has to be a form of respect because, like, 
I don't know how to explain my thinking. I was and just taught see, to respect it. You see, this is how Tanner respects a deer. And this woman, obviously, to speak about maimed fellow human beings, I realize they don't agree with each other. I realize they're at war. I'm not even going to take a side on the war. Although, you know, there's definitely a good argument for the Israeli uh, people to defend themselves. I mean, I'm not, I don't even want to get into that part of it. I'm just saying, those are human beings. When you don't think of your opponents as human beings, when you dehumanize them, when you objectify them, when you can make fun of them like this, okay, these people are going to get down. And we, the American people, we are not bystanders. We're not observers. This is affecting our world, our lives. We need to be clear about this. We need to be really clear about how much this can affect our lives. Please play number 2A. Live. You play that one more time. I want everybody, to, if, they, if you're watching on video, this is an explosion in Lebanon. Please take a look at this shock wave. That, that, that shock wave go through the sky. Quite an explosion. And look at that fireball. This is a next level weapon. I don't think it's a nuclear weapon. But we're talking about some serious destructive power here being unleashed in Lebanon. This is almost certainly American technology. And, you know, when, you, when this kind of violence gets unleashed, it affects every living organism on the planet. Hey, if you happen to be for the environment, like saving the earth from the machinations of man, I bet that's not so good. For the carbon footprint. Just saying, right? Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Uh, now, this kind of violence is going on uh, everywhere. I would like you to play a number three. This is in the Ukraine. Take a look at this explosion. Look at that. Looks like a nuclear fireball, doesn't it? There's the explosion. That's 300 miles inside of Russia only 250 miles from Moscow. Look at that explosion. Is that incredible or what? Does that look like a war to you? Mrs. Professor Pence says she doesn't see any evidence of war. Well, she's not looking at these kind of outtakes. There you go. Thank you, Tanner, that's good enough. So that was a, uh, a target uh, with, which Ukrainian drones attacked. It was a warehouse that was uh, storing uh, all kinds of uh, military hardware. Over 100 drones attacked that target, and there was missiles there, tactical missiles, Iskander tactical missiles, Tachka-U missile systems, anti-aircraft systems, uh, artillery ammunition, glide bombs, even possibly North Korean KN-23 ballistic missiles were stored at this facility. But the key here is this was 300 miles from the presumed Russian-Ukrainian border. This is an attack 300 miles inside Russia. 300 miles, only 250 miles from Moscow. So this uh, prohibition about attacking inside Russia, which has been a governor on Ukrainian military behavior since the start of the war, seems to be breaking down. We must remember that Putin has said, that if long-range missiles are used inside of Russia, Russian targets hundreds of miles from the Ukrainian border, that will be a declaration of war by NATO and the United States on Russia. And it's on, baby. And he said he's going to respond. We're right on the precipice of a war between NATO and Russia. Doesn't that seem a little excessive over the Ukraine? Does this seem reasonable? I mean, really. If you have children, grandchildren, are you willing to see these people die now, the people that you love, because of this war? You know, it's a question. What might, I mean, there's going to be people that are going to say, yes, 
yes, that Putin is just bluffing. He's just bluffing. And he's not going to respond. And the Ukrainians are winning. You know, you know, don't believe your lying eyes. Don't listen to your ears. You know, don't, don't, don't listen to what you're being told. It's all lie. Well, who's lying? I don't know. Putin, in the meantime, has ordered his third troop expansion since the beginning of the war. Uh, he issued a decree to boost the number of active soldiers by another 180,000 people. This means that the Russian armed forces now include 1.5 million active service people. That's 1.5 million with another 800,000 reservists. The total in the Russian army right now of 2.3 million. You know, this was on the follow-up of two prior expansions, one in August of 22 for 137,000, and again in December of 2023 for 170,000. This makes the Russian army, guess what? It's the second largest standing army in the world, just behind the Chinese. Hmm. Seems to me like they're taking this war rather seriously in Russia. I don't think we're taking it very seriously here in Minnesota. That's something else I kind of want to say, like <clears throat> these people that are saying Ukraine's winning, do they more so mean that Ukraine and all the allies are winning? Because Ukraine's getting so much help. It's not just Ukraine. And I feel like if we're thinking about it in a way that it is just Ukraine defending themselves against Russia, there's no way they're going to win. So then are they just leaving the part out that it's because, yeah, it's not just Ukraine fighting? There were, that, that is only directed at you and me. The Russians know full well they're fighting the full weight of the West. Right. Or what we would call the globalists. Yeah, I guess I was trying to clarify for myself, is that like what these elites are talking about or the people on, on TV when they're talking about Ukraine's winning and we're doing great? Like, do they more so mean that? They're talking to the American people to shield the American people from the obvious reality yeah. That Ukraine is doing whatever it's doing with the help of Western weapons, Western money, and tens of thousands of Western mercenaries that are fighting in the Ukraine, what they used to call soldiers of fortune. Hey, there's a lot of people. I know many of these people because I grew up with them that for, you know, 300,000 bucks a year, they'd like nothing better than to go to the Ukraine and kill Russians. It's not personal. It's just business, you know. Like what you're seeing there with that woman in Israel, that's personal. These people hate each other. They are willing to die. They're willing to fight barehanded. I mean, there's a famous story in 1973. That was the last really big war uh, in the Golan Heights, which at that time was controlled by Syria. Two armies, the Syrian army and the Israeli army, fighting in the Golan Heights, they actually just all consented out of the, you know, when you think that there's no communications between combatants, not, nah, they all put their guns down and fought with knives. Isn't that nice? Wait, where did, what? In the Golan Heights in 1973, thousands of combatants, Israeli and Syrian army, decided as a group, they hated each other so much they put their guns down and they fought with knives because, hey, you know, killing someone from a <laughs> two or 300 yards away is just not satisfying enough. It doesn't compare with thrusting a knife into someone's belly and looking at them in their eyes as they bleed out. It's way better, right? These people hate each other. That's not what a soldier of fortune is. A soldier of fortune for money goes to kill on the payroll. And when you say what's going on in the Ukraine, and what's going on in the Ukraine is uh, we got a lot of uh, Western, could be Australian, could be British, could be American, Canadians. Hell, it could be Mexicans. Who knows? Just not non-Ukrainian helpers. Non-Ukraine, not helpers, soldiers of fortune. They're on the payroll fighting the Russians. As a matter of fact, this guy that was... Um, just arrested for having an AK at the golf course where President Trump was uh, trying to get in a quick round of 18, that guy seems to have some involvement with the Ukrainians, right? All this stuff is unclear. Seems to. I'm not sure. 
I read it with a grain of salt. I don't know where the information's coming from. I'm not in control of how the information's getting to me. I'm at a point where, whoop, I'm not really confident in what I'm reading and seeing. But see, that's what X is so great about. X is so great because people get to post up. I mean, those those videos, the one in Lebanon and now this one in the Ukraine, these explosions, hard to fake. Do you think those explosions look real to you, Tanner? They yeah. did look real, right? They look pretty. That, that second video you showed was crazy because you could see, like, the sunset or you could still see some light in the sky. And the moment it blew up, you, it turned pitch black because that explosion was so bright. The camera was trying to adjust to its brightness that everything else turned black. So that's it. That is sca- that's 300 miles away. It's, it was like staring at a second sun, essentially. Like if you're looking at that video. You know, when you have this kind of violence, hard to get the genie back in the bottle, although it can happen. And, uh, you know, we have a very important election coming up here. We're about 40 days out. You know, I'm I'm just all in on this idea. A vote, a vote for Royce White is a vote for peace. We take a look at Amy Klobuchar here in Minnesota. If you're watching me in Minnesota, if you can spread out this idea to your friends, your family, your relatives, your co-workers, this woman has been in the Senate for 18 years. What has she presided over? A $35 trillion national debt, an open border, and she never voted against a war. She's so sweet. She smiles so nicely. She's so gentle. And what does she really do? She votes to kill people. That's what she does. And not wars of necessity, wars of discretion. This war that we're funding over in the Ukraine has nothing to do with me and my family. They keep telling me it does. Yeah, You know, I'm not buying it. It's, you know, obviously the violence is awful. I, my family comes from the Ukraine. I have a lot of ties to the region. Um, still, I don't get it. I don't see the benefit for myself personally. This is the third time in 100 years there's been a serious war in Europe. What, world War I, World War II, and now we got the start of World War III. Great. You know, the first time, all right, you know, sh- bleep this out, it happens. The second time, come on. What are we doing here? And now the third time, you know, this is supposed to be the new world order. If something was fenced, like we're going to have the United Nations and we're going to regulate war and prevent the possibility of Armageddon, the use of nuclear weapons, it's not working. The idea is not working. The beefs of the old world, the beefs of the old world seem to be impinging on the new world. So let's get this new world order thing out of the picture it didn't work. In other words, giving up all my freedom, all my ability to think, to talk, to feel, to work, to do whatever, you know, my freedoms, my sovereign rights as an American citizen, to give those up in exchange for safety, it's not working. So even if it was going to work, I would object to it because safety, you know, my freedom in exchange for safety is not a trade I'm willing to make. But when it doesn't work, come on, people. It reminds me of my friend Gene Robinson. He says, people, you know, we got to get out there and we got to understand that we got a group of people in this country that are all in on supporting this military-industrial complex. And what are they called? Democrats, liberals, progressives, communists. I don't care what we call them. They believe in the post-World War II Democrat liberal order. That's what they believe. Okay. They've taken out of fancy and out of popularity republicanism. The battle's not over. It's a yin-yang. Now we're trying to bring back rebirth republicanism here in Minnesota and the United States of America. You know, what, what does the globalist do? Here's what the globalist does. The Biden administration is sending Egypt its full $1.3 billion allocation of military aid setting aside conditions placed by Congress on some of the money over human rights concerns and citing Cairo's role as a mediator in the Israel-Hamas war. So let me translate. For some reason, Congress put restrictions on the transfer of money from the United States to Egypt. And because Egypt is playing some role as a mediator, 
our executive branch said, nope, we're giving them all the money. How does that work? It must be in the fine print of the legislation. These bills have fine print. I'll give you another one. Uh, I said many times that Barack Obama signed a military aid agreement with Israel uh, designating that $3.8 billion every year from 2015 to 2025 would be transferred to Israel in the form of American weapons. That's a pretty big deal, $38 billion over 10 years. Some good eating on that deal. And all of a sudden, it went from 2015 to 2025. Now every time I see it in the media, it's 2018 to 2028. I'm sure there was some kind of trigger or mechanism in the legislation that allowed for an extension. So now it goes from 2015 to 2028. It's a 13-year deal at $3.8 billion as a baseline. So in this legislation, there's, you know, back doors, I guess you'd have to say, or Trojan horses. But the Biden administration is sending that full $1.3 billion. And um, the decision shows the weight given to Egypt's role as a key mediator in a conflict that threatens to expand into a regional war and pose risk to the United States, even as allegations persist that President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi's government is behind a litany of human rights abuses. Okay, you know what it sounds like to me? It doesn't sound like foreign aid. It sounds like bribery. In other words, we're giving the Israelis money, we're giving the Egyptians money. Now, allegedly, they have a peace agreement. But that agreement's breaking down, as we've talked about, over the Philadelphia Corridor, which links Egypt and Gaza. Netanyahu has said he has to control that corridor. The Egyptians have said, no, you don't. That's our territory. And they're threatening to rip up the peace agreement between Egypt and Israel over this Philadelphia corridor. Well, come on. We're funding both sides of this thing, and we're supposed to be the post-World War II Democrat liberal order, which is all about human rights and civil rights and gay rights and minority rights and rights here and rights there. But hey, when it comes to the Egyptians, it's $1.3 billion and we don't care anymore. The we're just going to bribe you to stay with us because we're the new world order. We're going to pass the cash around like a mafia. There's a great scene. Hey, you know what? What was the first one I said we had to do? I already forgot it. Jim Brown. Okay, the next one is there's a scene in my favorite movie, Casino. Oh, no, Goodfellas, Goodfellas, where the main character is walking into the Copacabana, and he's giving everybody a 50, like my Uncle Benny would give me a 50 every time I saw him. You know, pass the cash around. Make people feel good. Well, if somebody gave me $1.3 billion, I'd be feeling pretty good about it. $1.3 billion? Come on. Of course they have to be grateful, right? No, they don't. Egypt is joining BRICS. They're joining the organization, the economic organization that's run by China and Russia. And I guess we're just going to pay. They're going to collect from both sides like the Turks. We got a lot of countries right now that are taking it in hand over fist from both sides. Why are we doing that? Pick a side of the football. Are we at war? Did you see those big explosions? Looks like we're at war. I mean, how can you straddle the middle on a deal like this? It's something to think about. Well, why do we... Uh, why do we allow it? We allow it because we're not paying very close attention to what's going on. I'm going to get back to this in terms of what it means um, as regards free speech. But our, our economics are tied up into this. You know, the, the government of the United States of America, when uh, President Biden took over, they, they passed a lot of spending bills. Spending. I'd like to spend you know, pass the cash around. It kind of helps with compliance. When you pass the cash around, people become very supportive of your ideology. But when they pass the cash around, the books don't balance, you have inflation. So we had this awful inflationary surge, it was up to 20% at one point, I think. Well, 
The Fed said it was 9.1% in mid-2022. Now it's come down to 2.5%. The Fed's target's 2%. Well, I guess if you go from 9 to 2.5, you're moving in the right direction. The Fed, the Federal Reserve, our central bank, a privately owned institution, something people don't focus on, has two mandates, controlling inflation and maintaining employment. These two things are oftentimes in opposition to each other. It's kind of a riddle. And how do they deal with it? They do it with money printing and interest rates. Now, they're not really in control of the money printing. The Congress is. That would be uh, Mike Johnson and Tom Emmer. They're in charge of the majority of the House, which is the Republicans. But these folks never saw a spending bill they didn't want to support. Because guess what? They're not really Republicans. They're really part of the Democrat liberal order. Now, I know I'm not supposed to talk this way. It's election season. But it is what it is. Because I remember when Tom Emmer and the Republicans came out and said at the end of 2022 that we're going to pass a debt ceiling raise and we're never going to have another continuing resolution. We're going to pass, as mandated, 12 spending bills every fiscal period, and actually follow the law. And here we are right now today passing another continuing resolution which obscures the spending, which just perpetuates about a $2 trillion deficit spend, which means the money supply keeps growing. Yet the Fed has lowered the interest rates. This is big news. This is the news that matters. The Fed lowered the interest rates by 50 basis points, which is a big deal. And as a small business owner and entrepreneur, I'm going to tell you, that's going to save me quite a bit of money every month. And they're alleged to lower it again two times this year, four times next year, and two times the year following. That's the forecast. In other words, very high interest, which is killing anybody that owns a business, is going to be reduced because the Fed understands that the, you know, The supply chain can't take it anymore. You can bend it, but if you break it, you got to live with massive unemployment. So now the unemployment rates are starting to drift up. So the Fed said, whoa, if we're going to maintain employment, we're going to have to take our foot off the throat of business. Because what they've been doing is taxing us. That interest goes upstream. It goes to the government. We're paying the government to the bank. The bank gets taxed. The bank money goes up to the Fed, the Fed money goes to the government. It's a giant money scheme to take the money uphill while the crap comes down on the American people. But they did lower the interest rates, which if you own a business is a positive, um, not trying to be a, um, a prognosticator. But if you don't have a balanced budget, if you continue to deficit spend $2 trillion a year, which is what we're doing, the likelihood that inflation will return is very high. The solution to our inflationary problem is balancing the budget. And let us remember, the Fed target for inflation is 2% a year. So the best we can hope for is in every administration, four years for a president, we have 8% inflation. That's the best we can hope for. In other words, every administration, If the Fed's doing its job, 8% is the inflationary rate over four years. That's the best we can hope for. Why is that? Why is that a fundamental judgment that that's okay? These are the things we have to ask ourselves because everything is continuing to go in the direction of we have no currency, we have no border, and we have no peace, and we have no well-being. Sounds like we don't have much of a country if we don't have those things. Let's talk a little bit about free speech because I'm speaking freely and boy, boy, oh boy, is there any truth in what I'm saying? Because you know it's an opinion. I'm giving you my opinion from my street corner. But let's just play some clips about how people feel about the street corner. Please play number four. He has he has lost his privileges and it should be taken down. And, And the bottom line is that you can't say that you have one rule for Facebook and you have a different rule for Twitter. 
the same rule has to apply, which is that there has to be a, 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 a responsibility that is placed on these social media sites to understand their power. They are directly speaking to millions and millions of people without any level of, of, of oversight or regulation. And I mean, that has to stop. That's nice. You know, the social media, um, the sites are being blamed, right? It's the people. I'm able to speak to thousands of people. It's not the, they're just a platform, right? And, uh, man, I have to look at so much disturbing stuff in social media. But I rather would look at things that disturb me and make me think than get a curated view of history and current events. Let's listen to an, another person here, Governor Newsom of California. Number five, please. There are a lot of deep fakes out there. There's not a lot of disclosure. There's not a lot of labeling. So among the many AI bills that are on the desk uh, are three specific election-related bills. And then do you want to sign some laws? Thought, you know, why, why waste your time with a politician unless they're going to do something for you? Two, two are signed, and, uh, and three are signed. And this is uh, now official. That is now uh, injunctive relief if you do any of those deep fake election misrepresentations. So that's how easy it is to govern uh, in California. That's how easy it is to govern with one party rule. The head administrator, in this case, Governor Newsom, pulls a bill out of his pocket as if it was, you know, the scorecard from the local high school baseball game, pulls it out, signs it, and you got injunctive relief. In other words, there's some governance of information. It's not free speech. It's been governed somehow. Let's play number six our Minnesota Governor Waltz. It's even more terrifying. I think we need to push back on this. There, there's no guarantee to free speech on misinformation or, or hate speech, and especially around our democracy. I think we need to push back on this. There, there's no guarantee to free speech on misinformation or, or hate speech, and especially around our democracy. What is misinformation? Is my opinion misinformation? Is my view of history a philosophy? Is that misinformation? Is it hateful, some of the things that I say, because I don't support the Democrat liberal order? Does that make me a hater because I don't share those values? What values don't I share? I mean, it opens me up to all kinds of potential charges. And when we see leaders of our movement, like Stephen K. Bannon, in jail, for the four months before the election, someone might have to say, what? We're, we're going to start, ah, well, the other street corner is going to say he didn't respond to a subpoena. Okay. Well, nobody else went to jail for not responding to subpoenas. People ignore congressional subpoenas all the time. Why did Peter Navarro go to jail and he's already out? Why is Steve Bannon in jail? Well, we can name... All kinds of people, like Merritt Garland, who didn't respond to congressional subpoenas. What is this? What is this? But when we have our leadership from the you know from the Democratic uh, uh, nominee, the, the 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 presidential hopeful Harris, to the governor of uh, California, to the vice presidential hopeful Waltz, and what do they have in common? That we have to govern how people speak which is in essence governing how they think and threatening them with criminality and with penalties for holding views that are misinformation, who's going to define misinformation? These are really critical questions. And uh, you can see we played several episodes ago that there's an effort now to change the Constitution. There's another eff effort to pack the Supreme Court or change the nature of the court because there's guardrails that are out there to stop one party or the other party from deviating from what's our you know what is you know enshrined in our constitution the rule book of how we live our lives something i want to point out real quick that i i find very rich about kamala's piece is she talks about how um 
we can't just have these different rules. One social media platform can't have a set of rules and not have the expectation of following this other one. And she used Facebook as an example. And that's hilarious because recently Mark Zuckerberg just wrote a letter addressing that the Biden-Harris administration had pressured him about the Hunter Biden laptop situation, um, anything to do with the the vid information. And um, so then for her to sit there and say, like, X needs to follow what Facebook is doing, but then Facebook coming out and saying, hey, guys, like that whole president campaign just pressured us to do things. It shows the true intentions. And also that is even scratching the surface of um, it's private property. Like Facebook is Mark Zuckerberg's and Elon Musk owns X. Why in the world does the government think that they have the power to come in and go, we're going to make you two play nice. Like it doesn't work that way. It's private property. They can do whatever the hell they want with that URL. It, I don't know. It, she's digging herself a hole. <laughs> I don't know. How well, I think, can talk that, so I think dumb. that all over the world, we have an effort now in many countries by many leaders to curtail what's said because it changes what people think. Why? Because the post-World War II Democrat double order narrative is being revealed in all of its contradictions, not the least of which we talked about one tonight. Here's El Sisi in Egypt, who has been labeled as a human rights uh, abuser, a violator of established international norms about human rights, human dignity. Our Congress put limits on foreign aid unless those human rights abuses were curtailed. And here we have the head of the free world, allegedly the head of the Democrat liberal order, allegedly the Biden administration saying, eh, well, hey, hey, uh, they're such a valuable mediator. Not, that's not what they are. They're extracting wealth from we the people because they're on both sides of the trade. The Egyptians are on both sides. They're dealing with the Chinese and the Russians and they're dealing with the West, and everybody's paying for them to adopt either the Eastern or the Western philosophy. And the Egyptians are just going to sit there and take in the middle as much as they can. I just had a friend who came back from Egypt. He told me that the contrast between the wealthy and the poor in Egypt is the starkest he's ever seen, that people literally live in garbage piles. And he was there and he saw it with his own eyes. I've seen such things myself. And so we're supporting a country with billions of dollars of aid that has a wealth gap such that citizens of Egypt live in piles of, of garbage. That's their home. So, you know, this is so revealing of the contradictions that are inherent in the Democrat liberal order that I guess it must be misinformation. I must be misinformed. In other words, what I'm sharing with you could be censored. Let's say I'm just wrong. Do I not have the opportunity to just be wrong? And through debate and through the sharing of the information and uh, evidence be revealed to be wrong? I would like the opportunity to make mistakes. I don't want it to be such that if I don't get it right the first time, I could be jailed. That's a little extreme when it comes to how I think and how I talk. But I want to share with you on a quite long clip. It's not a nine-minute clip, and it's worth it to go through it. And I know some of you are going to really dislike this because I know that uh, Hillary Clinton is not well-liked by some members of my audience. But let's listen to Rachel Maddow and Hillary Clinton talk on these issues for nine minutes because it's important for us to recognize what it is we're fighting for, which is freedom of thought, which includes freedom to worship, freedom of expression, free speech. These people want freedom to move, freedom to breathe. They want to take this away. Let's listen to this for nine minutes, and I'll see you on the other side. Tanner? Joining us now is Secretary Clinton, former Democratic presidential nominee, Secretary of State, U.S. Senator, First Lady. Her new book is called Something Lost, Something Gained, Reflections on Life, Love, and Liberty. It comes out tomorrow. Uh, I got halfway through my preview copy of the book and immediately ordered it for my mom and dad. Uh, <laughs> Secretary Clinton, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's a real pleasure. Rachel, it is always good to be with you. Thank you. I am struck by the fact that as his campaign 
careens into very, very offensive territory. The association with Holocaust deniers and the uh, outrages at Arlington National Cemetery, of all places, the insults to uh, recipients of the Medal of Honor, the recent um, incredibly racist and dangerous um, lies about specific groups of immigrants, Haitians in this case, um, and, and Venezuelans in the case of, of Colorado. I am struck by the fact that as much as we thought we might have been inoculated against sort of outrage tactics like that, where everything else gets thrown by the wayside and everybody starts responding to his outrage du jour, it's a way of sort of yanking everybody's chain, I sort of feel like we haven't learned. And um, he's, he's still being taught, especially by the media, that the more offensive he is, the more he can dominate the media space entirely. And I feel like you've, you've been a good diagnoser of that, um, not only from when you were up against mm -hmm. him, but from when others have done so. Do you have a, an antidote for that or a way that people can talk themselves out of taking that bait? I think that's really a critical question. And I, I think there's a couple of things going on here. You mentioned the press, and sadly, the press is still uh, not able to cover uh, Trump the way that they should. They careen from one outrage to the next. What was outrageous three days ago is no longer on the front pages, even though it threatens uh, the physical safety of uh, so many uh, people, particularly, as you point out, uh, immigrants that he and Vance have uh, decided to demonize. And I don't understand why it's so difficult for the press to have a consistent narrative about how dangerous uh, Trump is. Uh, you know, the late great uh, journalist Harry Evans, uh, you know, one time uh, said that, uh, you know, journalists uh, should, you know, really try to achieve objectivity. And by that, he said, I mean, they should cover the object. Well, the object in this case is Donald Trump. Uh, his demagoguery, his uh, danger to our country and the world, and stick with it. You know, they were merciless about uh, what they saw as uh, President Biden's, uh, you know, problems uh, in the debate and calling for him to uh, withdraw. I believe Donald Trump has disqualified himself over and over and over again to be uh, a presidential candidate, let alone a president. The second thing, though, is that part of what Trump is counting on is for people to get desensitized. I mean, oh, my gosh, did you hear what he said yesterday? Did you hear who he attacked? Did you hear the viciousness? And it just like with a shrug, OK, fine, we're moving on. Well, Americans need to understand that they have to take Trump both seriously and literally. He has said what he wants to do. He and his uh, allies with Project 2025, uh, his desire to be a dictator, at least on day one, all of that is in the public record. And I believe that more Americans have to be, you know, willing to endure what frankly is discomforting and, and to some extent kind of painful. Uh, to take him at his word and to be outraged by what he represents. And then finally, the hopeful side of this is that I do think more and more Americans are, you know, rejecting the kind of chaos that he represents. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't go back. That's what the Harris campaign says all the time. We're not going back. We're not going back to, you know, what he failed to do to protect American lives during COVID. We're not going back to the, you know, romance with dictators that puts, you know, innocent lives at risk and an America's security uh, in danger. We, we can't go back and give uh, this very dangerous man uh, another chance to do harm uh, to our country and the world. Speaking of dictators, um, the Justice Department and the State Department have taken another of action, a number of actions in the past several weeks, uh, striking actions um, to both call out and indict and take action against the Kremlin um, for their attempts at interfering in this, in, in yet another uh, presidential election cycle. 
on Trump's behalf. The State Department has put out a $10 million reward for information leading to, um, uh, for information about people who are trying to, about entities that are trying to illegally interfere um, in our election. We've seen these dramatic indictments from the Justice Department, including for paying millions of dollars, the Kremlin paying millions of dollars to pro-Trump influencers. Um, we've seen the Justice Department seize web domains where the Kremlin had set up news sites, what looked like news sites, looked like versions of American news sites, but were secretly operated um, by the Russian intelligence services or by the Russian government. You feel like the U.S. government is sort of starting to figure out how to do this and, and taking this seriously enough, or do you still think there's a far distance to go? I think there's a far distance to go. I applaud uh, the actions taken by uh, the Justice Department and the State Department. I think that they're very important. Uh, but truly, uh, we are just uh, at the beginning of uncovering everything that uh, Russia, but not just Russia, other countries uh, have done and are doing to influence our election. If you focus on Russia, and I commend you, Rachel, for your new movie, um, because we are only at the beginning of understanding the whole iceberg here. Uh, what the Russians uh, started doing in 2015 and 2016, what they continued doing, they've gotten more sophisticated. Uh, they aren't even pretending anymore. Uh, you know, their uh, international uh, news uh, operation, Russia Today, RT, um, is an arm of the Russian government, an arm of its intelligence operation. It's basically uh, an extension of their uh, spying efforts. They are using Americans, both those who are witting and willing, and those who are unwitting and, and are just so surprised. They're getting, you know, $400,000 a week uh, or $100,000 a podcast uh, to parrot uh, Kremlin propaganda. And we know from what even Republicans have said, the chairs of the Intelligence Committee and the you know, Foreign Affairs Committee and other Republicans who are currently in office have said uh, that Republicans go to the floor of the Congress and they parrot uh, Russian talking points. So I think it's important to indict uh, the Russians, uh, just as Mueller indicted a lot of Russians uh, who were engaged in uh, uh, direct election interference and boosting Trump back in 2016. But I also think there are Americans who are uh, engaged in uh, this kind of propaganda. Uh, and whether they should be civilly or even in some cases criminally charged uh, is something that would be a better deterrence because the Russians are unlikely, uh, except in a very few cases, to ever stand trial uh, in the United States. You know, they're not going to be uh, going to a country where they can be extradited or even returning to the United States uh, unless they are, are very foolish. So I think we need to uncover all of the connections and make it very clear that you could vote however you want, but we are not going to let adversaries, whether it is Russia, China, Iran, or anybody else, uh, basically try to influence Americans as to how we should vote in picking our leaders. Well, that was great. Um, thank you for enduring that. Uh, just a couple of quick points. When Hillary Clinton indicts uh, foreign news sources like RT as being agents of the security state, one must ask themselves, what about the mainstream media here in the United States? And when I ask that question, am I perpetuating the kind of misinformation that could lead to my arrest? You know, this is really a slippery slope we're in here. This is meant to intimidate me as, you know, your humble podcaster and you as the audience. Maybe they're going to criminalize even listening to alternative viewpoints. and. The idea that, um, boy, that's nice. I can vote for whoever I want to, uh, but we're not going to let other uh, countries influence our elections. Well, you know, last I checked, I'm not getting $100,000 a podcast from the Russians to talk about Russian history, or we're going to talk about Solzhenitsyn just in a minute. It's, it's part of our world. It's part of our world and the history of these countries. 
and how they think about things and how they think about us, the American people, is critical for me as a citizen and as a voter with the franchise to self-govern. It's critical for me to know how other people think. Otherwise, I'm somewhat of a Darwinist, right? If I don't care about my neighbor, if I don't love my neighbor as I want to be loved, if I just cut off their thinking and say what you think is misinformation, you're wrong. That would mean my culture is the truth and yours is a myth, which is the gateway to genocide. And we see genocides breaking out around the world. So the dialogue, the dialogue, the investigation, the search for truth, that is what it is to be a Republican. That's what being a Republican is all about. It protects my Constitution, protects my minority rights, my, my minority right to inquire, to share what I think, to share what I feel. I'm protected. But these people are living not in Republicanism. They're living in the post-World War II Democrat liberal order. Liberal means progressive. Progressive means socialist. Socialist means communist. I don't care how you brand it. They're authoritarians. They don't believe in republicanism. They don't believe that my rights are granted to me by a creator. They believe my rights come from man, and man then can alter what rights I'm allowed to exercise as a citizen of the world. That's where we're at. It's a very clear choice. I don't want to hear people talking about, I don't like this politician, I don't like that politician. You're either voting for tyranny or you're voting for freedom. I mean, it's very clear to me. I hope you can make it clear to the people that you're talking to. And let's just go back just a few decades when America was in its possibly its third turning. I'm talking about in the period of the 60s, the 70s, of 80s. Um, there was a Russian writer named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, a name that Tanner is hearing for the first time. Many, may, perhaps many of you are hearing for the first time the name Solzhenitsyn. And what made Solzhenitsyn great? Well, let's just do a little biography. He was a Russian author and Soviet, which means Russian, dissident. Because you need to call it the Soviet Union. It was Russia. Just like if you're a Democrat or a liberal or a progressive or a socialist or a communist, you know, you're all kind of out of the same pot. You know, maybe one's a carrot, one's a pea, but you all got boiled in the pot together. The thinking is similar. And we have the Soviet Union, which was Russian, and he was a Soviet Russian dissident who helped to raise global awareness about political repression in the Soviet Union, especially in the Gulag prison system. How did he do that? Freedom of speech, which he didn't have, he still got his works out into the public domain. And these works, man, if you read them, they're opaque. They're, it's not an easy read. Russians, boy, Russians have a great literary tradition, a great musical tradition, and they're complex. And he wrote some books that were, really some were actually smuggled out of Russia that led to him being awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1970. Now, it's not like these were feel-good books. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature not just because of what he wrote, but that he had the courage to write at all. This was a great man. And it said right when he got the award, quote, uh, he got the Nobel Prize for Literature, quote, for the ethical force with which he has pursued the indispensable traditions of Russian literature. In other words, the search for truth, for the ethical force with which he has pursued the indispensable traditions of Russian literature. That's the search for truth. He, he got the Nobel Prize from the globalists not that long ago, 1970. What is that? 54 years ago, we were rewarding a Russian citizen for having the courage to speak his opinions, his search for truth, in the face of tremendous repression of free speech and free movement. His nonfiction work, The Gulag Archipelago, quote, 
amounted to a head-on challenge to the Soviet state and sold tens of millions of copies. So this was a great man who used literature, the world of ideas, to confront an authoritarian leftist regime, leftist, like the Nazis, like the progressives, like the liberals, like the communists, like the socialists, like the Democrat Party, a leftist authoritarian regime. He staked out a position where he fought this regime in the world of ideas. And this man was born in, uh, in Russia in a, in a small town called Kislovatsk. Kislovatsk. Uh, his father uh, and mother, they, they came from some, there was some wealth in that family, and that wealth was dissipated right after the Russian Revolution. His father died in a hunting accident. He was brought up by his mother. He was brought up poor. He fought in World War II. He served as a commander of an um, artillery battery. It was a sound raging battery, which is interesting. They used to listen to the sounds and take measurements of the sounds of the German artillery batteries, and they'd destroy these batteries. He was awarded the Order of the Red Star because he you know, destroyed some German artillery batteries by adjusting counter-battery fire onto them, resulting in their destruction. So he was a hero. Um, he witnessed uh, terrible war crimes against the local German civilians, you know, at the end of the war. And uh, he was um, quite uh, self-critical just because he was a Russian and he was involved in this because, uh, you know, it was not a kind war, right? Solzhenitsyn wrote in the Gulag Archipelago, quote, there is nothing that so assists the awakening of omniscience within us as insistent thoughts about one's own transgressions, errors, and mistakes. After the difficult cycle of such ponderings over many years, whenever I mention the heartlessness of our highest-ranking bureaucrats, the cruelty of our executioners, I remember myself and my captain's shoulder boards and the forward march of my battery through East Prussia, enshrouded in fire, and I say to myself, so were we any better? That is taking responsibility. That's self-governance. And he went all the way with this thing. So even though Solzhenitsyn became a communist, you know, he'd been raised in the, in the Orthodox Church of Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church. His mother was a believer. He was raised that way. He was caught up in the zeitgeist of his times. He became a, a, a communist an atheist, a believer in the Soviet Socialist Republic, fought the Nazis, and it was in that pondering of the barbarity that was associated with that godless ideology as it confronted the Nazi godless ideology, how they fought, how men fought with barbarism without any concept of uh, humanity. Um, the raping, the killing, the pillaging was so intense that even though his own conduct in the war was relatively more ethical, he felt like he had to take responsibility. And uh, this led him to rediscover um, his Russian Orthodox faith. And uh, he was eventually uh, banished from the country. He was exiled because he was such a powerful figure. And again, these very, I mean, if Hillary Clinton was a politician in 1970, she would have lionized uh, Solzhenitsyn as a speaker of truth, of a searcher for truth. And uh, But now we've forgotten that. Now we need new Solzhenitsyns to emerge here in the United States. And, of course, they're emerging in the podcast space. And when they emerge in the podcast space, what happens? They are... Um, demonized as anti-Semites, racist, homophobes, xenophobes. The full weight of the security state comes upon them. Um, you can't even question certain things here in, the, in our country without being labeled with the most scurrilous of labels. Um, Solzhenitsyn was labeled an anti-Semite. Um, in a 1974 essay, Repentance and the Self-Limitation in the Life of Nations, 
Solzhenitsyn urged Russians and Gentiles alike, Russian Gentiles and Jews alike, excuse me, Russian Gentiles and Jews alike, to take moral responsibility for the renegades, that's his word, from both communities who enthusiastically embraced atheism and Marxism-Leninism and participated in the Red Terror and many other acts of torture and mass murder following the October Revolution. He asked his you know, fellow citizens to take responsibility for what was actually a very horrible uh, historical event in human history. Branded an anti-Semite. Branded an anti-Semite. Well, okay. What did he really do? What he really did was, over the course of his lifetime, uh, he went from being a committed Marxist to returning to his Orthodox Christian roots, and he gave over to them. Because under the pressure of repression and imprisonment, he served eight years in a gulag, which is, you know, a lot most people didn't get out of it. Well, I mean, it was a death sentence to go to a gulag. It was not a friendly place. He went to prison for criticizing Stalin in a private letter. I want you to think about how intense this repression of thinking and speech had gotten. He wrote a private letter to a friend of his where he criticized Stalin, and they imprisoned him because of a private musing for eight years. His thought was so repressed that even in private, he could not criticize the supreme leader of the Soviet Republic. And when he was suffering there for those eight years, suffering, loss of freedom, risk of death, I mean, in his case, he came very close to dying. Um, in that miracle, he got cancer when he was imprisoned. He was destined to die, and he was healed in very unpleasant circumstances. So one must ask themselves, what kind of miracle was that? What kind of spiritual power came from his healing on the, the brink of death? At death's door, he survived. And he went through some kind of psychological process which restored his faith. Um, I just want you to play, just a, go in about three minutes in and just play about 20 seconds of number eight. I have already found out, and others will find just out in the course bit. of their lives, that truth eludes us if we do not concentrate our attention totally on its pursuit. But even while it eludes us, there's, a, for those of you who have video images, there's a picture of Solzhenitsyn in 1978. To many misunderstandings. Also, okay, thank you, Tanner. I just wanted to get a video of him up there. That's Solzhenitsyn in 1978 delivering the commencement address at Harvard University. Harvard University. And uh, it was the 327th commencement address. Um, I was in the East Coast going to school at that time. Uh, he, Solzhenitsyn was a thinker and a futurist. And I just want to read some highlights from this speech. Uh, many of you have already found out, and others will find out in the course of their life, that truth eludes us if we do not concentrate our attention totally on its pursuit. The search for truth. This man was a believer. Any of our contemporaries readily identifies two world powers each of them already capable of entirely destroying the other. However, understanding of the split often is limited to this political conception, that danger may be abolished through successful diplomatic negotiations or by achieving a balance of armed forces. The truth is that the split is much more profound and a more alienating one that the rifts are more than one can see at first glance. This deep, Manifold split bears the danger of manifold disaster for all of us in accordance with the ancient truth that a kingdom, in this case our earth, <clears throat> divided against itself cannot stand. What was Solzhenitsyn seeing? 
Solzhenitsyn uh, identified that we in the West tend to view the whole world through our own lens of description as if we're the best, which is, you know, the bedrock of the Democrat liberal order. That's why we're fighting all over the world to make it stick. I mean, if it was really the best, would we have to fight to make it work? We wouldn't. People would just do it because it's the best. Not everybody thinks it's the best. And what we missed here is, is that there's competing ideologies in the world. Let's focus on the Russians, which Hillary Clinton is saying, if I talk about it, it's misinformation. But there's a Russian history, a Russian philosophy, and what is it tied up in? It's tied up in Christianity. Remember, Putin uh, rejected the Marxist takeover of the revolution and said that Russia is a Christian country. And what Solzhenitsyn is talking about is he's drawn out the distinction between a liberal world order, a Democrat liberal order, which is based on 50% plus one, and the religious view, which has absolutes about right and wrong. And he's saying this rift, man, this rift is not reconcilable. I'll go on. For 1,000 years, Russia belonged to such a category, although Western thinking systematically committed the mistake of denying its autonomous character and therefore never understood it, just as today the West does not understand Russia in communist captivity. Well, it's no longer captured by the communists. This is how sophisticated Solzhenitsyn's thinking was. Let me continue because we're going to run out of time. But the blindness, they're talking about the West, but the blindness of superiority continues in spite of all and upholds the belief that the vast regions everywhere on our planet should develop and mature to the level of present-day Western systems, which in theory are the best and in practice the most attractive. There is this belief that all those other worlds are only being temporarily prevented by wicked governments or by heavy crises or by their own barbarity from taking the way of Western pluralistic, pluralistic democracy and from adopting the Western way of life. Countries are judged on the merit of their progress in this direction. However, it is a conception which develops out of Western incomprehension of the essence of other worlds out of mistake of measuring them all with a Western yardstick. In Solzhenitsyn posits, that our country has fallen apart. And he frames it out like this, that a decline in courage may be the most striking feature which an outside observer notices in the West. The Western world has lost its civil courage, both as a whole and separately, in each country, in each government, in each political party, and, of course, in the United Nations, that such a decline in courage is particularly noticeable among the ruling groups and the intellectual elite caused an impression of loss of courage of the entire society. Loss of courage. Well, you know, someone who's a savage is willing to die for what they believe, but a decadent has nothing they believe in so much that they're willing to die for it. And that's materialism. Every citizen, he continues, has been granted the desired freedom and material goods in such quantity and of such quality as to guarantee, in theory, the achievement of happiness in the morally inferior sense of the word which has come into being during these same decades. In the process, however, one psychological detail has been overlooked. The constant desire to have still more things in a still better life and the struggle to attain them imprints many Western faces with worry and even depression, though it is customary to conceal these feelings. Active, intense competition fills all human thoughts without opening a way to free spiritual development. Now he's starting to sound a little bit like Professor Penn because I didn't come up with these ideas. He's saying that the Western world has been unbalanced towards materialism and lacks in a spiritual center. 1978, it was clear to Solzhenitsyn what we're commenting here in 2024. And he continues that what we've done here is we have legalistically defended human rights so intensively that destructive and irresponsible freedom has been granted 
boundless space. Society appears to have little defense against the abyss of human decadence, such as, for example, the misuse of liberty for moral violence against young people, such as motion pictures full of pornography, crime, and horror. It is considered to be a part of freedom and theoretically counterbalanced by the young people's right not to look or not to accept. Life organized legalistic, legalistically has thus shown its inability to defend itself against the corrosion of evil. He talks about good and evil. And why not? Because he continues again that the hastiness and, superficial, and superficiality are the psychic diseases of our time. And more than anywhere else, this disease is reflected in where? In the mainstream media, such as it is. However, the press has become the greatest power within the Western countries, more powerful than the legislative power, the executive, and the judiciary. And one would then like to ask, but by what law has the press been elected, and to whom is it responsible? In the Communist East, a journalist is frankly appointed as a state official. But who has granted Western journalists their power? For how long a time? And with what prerogatives? See how this ties into what Hillary Clinton is saying? And he concludes with something so heavily, so heavy. But if someone should ask me whether I would indicate the West as a model to my own country for development, frankly, I would have to neg answer negatively. No, I could not recommend your society in its present state is an ideal for the transformation of Russia. Through intense suffering, listen to this, through intense suffering, our country has now achieved a spiritual development of such intensity that the Western system in its present state of spiritual exhaustion, exhaustion does not look attractive. Even those characteristics of your life, which I have just mentioned, are extremely saddening. A fact which cannot be disputed is the weakening of human beings in the West, while in the East they are becoming firmer and stronger. For 60 years our people, and for 30 years the people of Eastern Europe, lived under communism. During that time, we have been through a spiritual training far in advance of Western experience. Life's complexity and moral weight have produced stronger, deeper, and more interesting characters than those generally produced by standardized Western well-being. The American intelligentsia has lost its nerve. It sure has. We have no leadership. Solzhenitsyn posits that you can tell a society is decaying when its leadership and when its people lack courage, when its art becomes decadent, and when there are no great statesmen to lead the people out of its malaise. And is that not where we're at today? Are we not lacking in courage? Are we not, as Republicans, afraid to go into the street, afraid to volunteer our time to defend our freedoms, that in doing so we may risk, that the risk mutes us and keeps us in our houses watching mindless and decadent entertainment? Is that not the life we're living? And do we have statespeople that emerge to lead us out of this trap? No, we do not have the people yet coming with the go. Oh, and when they do come, like a Royce White, oh, anti-Semite. You see, this is the trap that Solzhenitsyn had seen, had seen for us many, many years ago. And he concluded that liberalism is invariably displaced by radicalism that radicalism will surrender to socialism, and that socialism will not resist communism. You see, he's not fooled because he's an outsider. Democrat, progressive, liberal, socialist, communist. He doesn't care because he knows where it's going because he's been there. If humanism were right in declaring that man is born only to be happy, man would not be born to die. Since his body is doomed to die, Man's task on earth evidently must be of a more spiritual nature. It cannot be unrestrained enjoyment of everyday life. It cannot be the search for the best ways to obtain material goods and then cheerfully get the most we can. 
It has to be the fulfillment of a permanent, earnest duty so that one's life journey may become an experience of moral growth, so that one may leave life a better human being than when one started it. It is imperative to review the table of widespread human values. Its present incorrectness in America is astounding. I find myself aligned with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He's identified in 1978 before a Harvard graduating class that America lacked a spiritual dimension, that we'd given over to the satisfaction of human needs and wants in a material sense and had done such a good job of it that we made ourselves weak. Does this not sound like the world we're living in today? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? It, What is this book? This is a address that everybody can go watch online. It's on YouTube. The 1978 commencement address that Solzhenitsyn gave to Harvard University graduates in 1978. It's an hour long. It's not easy. It's not easy to listen to, but as far back as 1978, when I was in college becoming weak, that's why I left. I left college and entered training. That's when I started training. That's me. We need it for all of our citizens. And just to share with you on the way out uh, the depth of Russian culture, what we face, uh, we're going to go out with the fourth movement of Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony. Shostakovich, another person many people don't recognize the name, one of the greatest composers of all human history, a Russian who had fallen out of um, favor with the Stalinist regime and part of his redemption was his writing of the Fifth Symphony and the use of the Fifth Symphony as what? As popular art to strengthen the Russian people in their battle against the Nazis. And I would like you to listen to this piece of music. It's, it's about 10 minutes long. Thank you for staying late. Just to understand who these people are, that I'm not even supposed to talk about this, that it's misinformation. No. No, no. We need to know who our enemies are. We need to know what they think and why they think it. And we need to critique our own behavior because world wars do not happen in a vacuum. And there's multiple street corners about how we got to the struggle that we find ourselves in. And if we don't understand how we got here, if we don't have the courage to inquire, to search for truth, then we will be ruled by leaders who are not searching for truth. They're lusting for power. On that note, I want to thank you for joining. Look forward to seeing you soon again. Tanner, good morning again. Please cue up Shostakovich number five.